Sagal, Sewaguego, Yun Gyat, Stan Hill. You got your lot. Oh, I can't even say it. Um, um, I'm, I'm learning my language, which is Ganyahaga. Um, I'm of the Turtle Clan, I'm Mohawk. My mother was from the Six Nations Reservation, which is near Oshwegan, Ontario. My father was from the Tuscarora Reservation, which is in Lewiston, New York. I grew up in Lewiston, New York, worked my whole social work career in Buffalo, um, retired over there from New York State Service and moved back to my mom's reserve, which is where my membership is, um, and found a really cool job working for the Six Nations Family Health Team as their psychotherapist. Um, I want to talk about, I don't think, that, is that moving? I don't think it's moving, it's not going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this book was, was something that I never intended to, um, to write. I just like to write. I call writing my uh, coping skill. It is really helpful for me to kind of get my mind organized, put my thoughts down. And so this book is all about memoir. These are stories that I wrote just to kind of put down what was going through my head. I would share it with my sisters in the morning. And um, what happened is I met somebody who just so happened to be a um, publisher and just mentioned to her that, you know, I like to write. Yagalados means she's a storyteller in Mohawk. And, um, she said, I'd like to read some of your writing. And I'm like, nah, it's for my family. She said, no, I really want to read it. And so here we have this book that I never intended to get published. Um, I am a social worker. I attended the university at Buffalo. I actually took 15 years to get my degree because I was a um, single mom for a bit and I was looking after my kids. So I worked as a keyboard specialist and then an administrative assistant while I was taking um, um, social science interdisciplinary studies with a concentration in community mental health. And then when I was done with that, I was in the right place at the right time again, and um, social work moved up to the floor that I was working in, and I ended up talking to the dean, and they had this new program called a BA slash MSW, and I was accept it without even taking any graduate record exams because I was already in the college and I was already matriculated. So yeah, I ended up with a master's degree in social work, which wasn't really my intention. My intention was just to finish my undergraduate degree and maybe be an addictions counselor. So um, I want to talk about the picture on the front of this. This is my mother. And I had never seen this picture or the one on the back until I September 30th, 2017. I was living here at Six Nations and they did an orange shirt day there and so I went. And um, after the day, which was a day full of crying, I was in Mohawk, oh, geez, oh, oh boy, I, I'm not doing so good with my Mohawk today. Ajitawis, Ajitawis means a crybaby. The whole day I cried because it was very emotional. I feel like the moment I got out of my car and I stepped on that property, I felt this trembling with, you know, trembling dissonance inside of me. It was a rough day. And um, I remember there was a lot of people there, a lot of people from other nations, not just Six Nations, but all over because many of them were brought to this, what, what they referred to as the mush hole. Back then it was called the Mohawk Institute it's now called the Woodland Cultural Center in, in Brantford. The community, some of the community at Six Nations wanted it torn down. It's a very big building. And other people didn't want it torn down because they wanted to save the evidence. So they did a save the evidence campaign and they saved the building. And now it's a museum and there are a lot of um, people that come in there every day and they do tours. But when I went that day, it was still closed and under renovation. So I went into the museum next door to it and I watched a virtual tour. And while I was in there watching that virtual tour by myself, because my sister wouldn't come with me because she didn't want to be a Jitoís, they, they showed the one right side of the building where the girls dormitory stairs used to be, but they had taken them out because they, you know, made it into office space. So they had one of those big booms on the camera that had went up to where the landing would have been. 
and showed it. And my mother's signature was on that wall. And that was pretty, I don't even know what the word is. <laughs> I, I shattered. It was, it was gruesome for me to be sitting there in that darkened theater and to see my mother's signature there because I was told my mother wasn't there, that they had no record of my mother whatsoever there. And so that was that. But I knew she was because she and two of her sisters were there. Um, they called my mother, all her siblings, because she was the oldest, they all called her Akjia. Akjia in Mohawk means my older sister. And so they all, they all you know, said that they were there with Akjia. And um, so I watched that video, went out of there, just, you know, total disbelief of the things that I heard in there. One of the things that the um, narrator talked about was that um, all these children there were just like little guinea pigs, little brown guinea pigs. The, the um, armed services would come in and they would test out their meals ready to eat on them. You know, if, and if they didn't survive, oh, well, we got to go back and reformulate our meals that we usually give the soldiers out in the theater of ward. The um, pharmaceutical people would come in and they would try out their new drugs on these children. If they died, oh, well, we gotta go back and reformulate these new drugs. I even was doing research and I found, anybody know what pablum is? On their website it says that they would test their, their formula on residential school children. So if those children died, oh, well, we gotta go back and reformulate go back to Toronto and, you know, fix the formula. Reading that, I was just like, ooh, hurt, anger, just pain. And um, listening to Lori Gallant, who was the narrator of that video, it was, it was just heartbreaking. And I walked out of that museum that afternoon and I almost ran right into physically into this lady that I had done an internship back in my um, undergraduate days at Children's Aid Society in Oshwegan. Her name was Ida Martin. I almost ran right into Ida and um, I was crying. So she gave me a big hug, which I needed. And um, I said, Ida, I have a question I need to ask you. I said, you know, I, many times I asked my mother about her time at the mush hole. And every time she shut down, she wouldn't talk about it. She disassociated. She held herself differently. If I touched her, she would flinch. I said, but she never spoke of her time here. And she started nodding her head. And I said, why are you nodding your head? She said, because she's part of that Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And she's heard, she said, hundreds, if not thousands of hours of testimony. And what she found was that people who were the oldest, I don't know how to say it in the male version, they would take it upon themselves or they would be charged with looking after their siblings. But that was hard to do because once they came in that door, they were assigned numbers, no longer was she Hazel Leona Van Every? She was number something, which I don't even know. And then her siblings, my two aunties, were given numbers far beyond hers, like not consecutive order. You know, they would spread them way apart because they didn't want them to see each other in the, the, the lunch lineup, the, the lineup to go to Mohawk Chapel. They didn't want any interaction between them. And if, you know, it was, uh, um, male and a female sibling, they really had no, con no connection. They would separate them by gender, absolutely. So I said to her, well, I don't under understand why she would never speak of it. You know, my aunties would say, I loved it at the mush hole. I learned how to cook, I learned how to clean, I learned how to iron, I learned, you know, all of these great things to do, it was good. And she again shook her head and she said, Again, because your mother probably was a protector, she probably took it upon herself to look after them, whatever they had coming to them, whether it was a beating, or maybe a, somebody had their eye on them, was gonna sexually molest them. She would step up and say, no, take me. Don't, don't touch them, 
take me, I'll take it. Whatever it is that they have come into them, or whatever you had planned for them, take me. And um, she said that's why they could talk about it, because they could access those memories, whereas your mother could not. And that's her. Um, as many others, you know, have this, that same, those same shots, front, side, profile. Looking at that, I see my son, I see my sister, I see myself. I've had four children, and I cannot imagine at the age of nine, because that was 1934, my mother was nine. Oh, I have to tell you, at the end of the day, after this was all done, I went and I sat in my car, and it was way behind the um, mush hole. That's what they call it. They called it mush hole because for three meals a day, that's what they got was mush. That was it. Sometimes it was mealy, had mealy worms in it, and they had to eat it, even if they didn't like it. And um, I was sitting behind the mush hole, looking at the whole back side of it, and all of a sudden my phone, you know, pinged because I had checked in that morning. And it was those two pictures, and I kept going from one to the other, thinking, who is this? That looks like my son Jordan. That looks like my sister Bila. Who is this? And then my friend who sent it to me, who used to work at the cultural center, she said, that's your mother in 1934. Um, me and Matt don't really get along. I'm not really a rocket scientist kind of a person. But I did my calculations, and I thought, she was nine. She was nine years old in this picture. And that was her getting processed into that place on September 1st, 1934, at nine years old. And she didn't get out of there again until 1940, when she was 16. And when she got out, she went into the armed services because she was so institutionalized, I guess is the word. And she never, ever again spoke her language, which was Mohawk, Ganyagahaga. Um, ooh, I want to talk about this. This is the Carlisle Indian School. In February, I went down to see my daughter. She was at Penn State down in Hershey. And um, on the way home, I had spent the weekend with her. It was her birthday. And on the way home, I saw Carlisle. And my car just went, irks. I got off the road, and I went to Carlisle. I put it in my, my um, GPS to go to Carlisle Indian Industrial School. And I, it was eight miles away. So I went there. And it took me to the parking lot of some like home hardware place. And I got out and I went in and there was a guy behind the counter who I instantly had um, transference, you know, that counter transference and transference. As a social worker, you are going to run into people who when you see them, they remind you of somebody else. And instantly you have to recognize that and be aware of it. And I instantly looked at him and thought of my step-grandfather, he looked just like him. And he was tall and he, ooh, he just, I just had a bed. And I said to him, I'm here because I, I'm looking for the Carlisle Industrial Indian School. And he said, oh, no, I've never heard of that. Never, ever heard of that. Are you sure it's here? I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's here somewhere. Oh, he said, there's an Army Depot right over that way. If you go that way, there's an Army Depot. So I knew, I just knew, you know, that intuition. We're all gifted with that intuition. I knew he was lying to me. I just knew it. I have been in situations on home visits. Maybe even a home visit turned into a crime scene one time with Channel 7 and yellow tape. And I knew somebody was lying to me. So I knew he was lying to me. And so I walked out of there, and I got in my car, and I turned right towards the Army Depot. And I don't even think I got from here to that red chair away. And there was this great big sign that said Carlisle Industrial Indian School. But he stood there and told me he'd never heard of it before. So yeah. And as I, I, I just pulled over right at the sign, and I read it, and I took a picture of it. And then I turned like this back towards the road. And there, right at the road, were all of these little gravestones, all in a row. They looked new. They were shiny white. And I went over there, and I looked at them, and they had all these indigenous names on them. And again, I just had this feeling that this is a put on. Like, they, what? They're going to put this at the road? And I don't understand what's going on here. 
yeah, that was that was another time where instantly my stomach was like, ugh, just something isn't quite right here. So I wrote a story about that too, but it's not in here. <laughs> so I do want to share a story with you, and I'm going to read Spick and Span. Okay, and this is um, something I wrote. I can't even remember how long ago. Again, memoir. But every one of these stories have trauma that weaves through them, is woven through them. So spick and span. I woke up one morning and my first thought was of my mother. I thought about the two pictures that were sent to me on Facebook. They reminded me of mug shots that are taken when you're getting arrested and processed. When you're facing a night in the slammer after some altercation or breaching some law. One a side profile, the other a full frontal of her nine-year-old face. This nine-year-old girl hadn't stolen anything or assaulted anyone, hadn't lied about anything either. Her only crime was being born brown in a world that doesn't value that color. She hadn't been arrested, hadn't been processed through any judicial system for her crime of being an Angwahoi child. Angwahoi means um, the original people. She wasn't about to spend a night or two in this holding cell referred to as the mush hole. She spent seven years there, from the age of nine until she turned 16. I can't understand how government and church can somehow rationalize taking children forcefully from their parents and community in order to strip them down with the intention to remove all inner traces of their nativeness. Their language banned and rebranded as filthy talk of savages. These children's spiritual belief systems were also stripped away. Whatever their traditional beliefs were, they were also rebranded as evil beliefs of the pagans. How could she be called that just because her belief system was not that, was not that ascribed to by the dominant culture? I imagine her alone, confused, away from her family, the beliefs that tied her to her reality and knowledge of what is right and wrong were broken. All her beliefs and language crushed and broken at her feet. My mother was a strong person. She survived this soul-crushing re-education and indoctrination machine somehow. I thought about myself as a nine-year-old and the many times I encountered racism in my young life. I remember a field trip when I was in the fifth grade. We were taken to a bowling alley in Lewiston, New York. I was standing in line at the counter about to rent the ugly bowling shoes. A man standing next to me at the counter looked down at me and said, I smell shit. I was surprised at first to hear that offhanded remark, not really understanding what he was inferring. I hadn't shat myself. I, I bathed that morning. I had not stepped in dog shit. There were no remnants on my shoes. I checked. I knew how to wipe my own ass, wash my hands thoroughly afterwards. I kept checking things off in my head. I knew it couldn't be me. Suddenly, the realization hit me that what he really meant was that I was the piece of shit. I was the stench in his nostrils. It was me, this little brown indigenous girl invading his territory. I wasn't where I belonged. I was off the res. This white man in his denim overalls and plaid shirt with frayed hems, wearing rubberized boots that were probably covered in pig shit, was standing there in judgment over me, a child. I don't think people are born to be racist bastards. I think this is a learned belief. They are taught by their families, social or political groups, in which all indigenous peoples, or insert any other ethnic minority group here, are different, dirty, less than. That all Indians are drunkards, all Indians are lazy, all Indians are on welfare, all merciless Indian savages, heathens, pagans. These messages, then become internalized beliefs that that person doesn't question. They don't go out and do a scientific study of natives to see if they do in fact fit within those parameters 
or if they do meet a native person who doesn't drink or has an advanced degree or holds down a professional position, they are looked at as an anomaly, an outlier. My aunts often state it proudly that they learn to cook and clean at the mush hole. They learn how to sew, do laundry properly, and iron clothes. They were trained to be domestics because, of course, back then in the 1930s, they couldn't become anything else, could they? A good work ethic was instilled or maybe even beaten into them. Back when they were at the mush hole, the dominant culture did not value our indigenous cultural beliefs. They didn't believe that we could achieve any kind of advanced degrees or professional level of educational status. All my mother and her sisters were taught to aspire to was to be the best housekeeper domestic that they could be. When, when you think about it, what kind of jobs were they being trained to do? They're not gonna be able to go out there and be a secretary. They're not gonna be able to go out there and do anything but that. I don't even call it a school. That was not a school. What I really yearned to know was the collective memories of my mom and her sisters. To be privy to all that they saw and heard while interned there. I wanted to know their psychological scars and how they were changed by their time spent there. None of them were ever branded with an assigned number on their arms like the Holocaust survivors were, yet they endured abuse, they endured pain, and they endured starvation. They faced linguistic and cultural obliteration. What they suffered is what I needed to know. How did becoming survivors after all they bore change their brains, change their beliefs? What did their confinement do to them? And what is the legacy of abuse, neglect, and cultural genocide? Now, you know, the Pope was here and he actually said, yes, it was genocide. But we knew it was genocide long before he admitted to that because you look up the UN, you know, the UN, they have conventions and then one of them is on genocide. And we, many of us maybe, meet those same criteria for genocide. When I was in college, when I first got out of high school, I remember doing a paper on the Holocaust. I was very interested in the Holocaust. And I did a lot of research, and I, I came to find that, that um, they said in, in these research paper that the, the genocide that the Jewish people were subject to changed them. They talked about um, you know, their DNA being changed. They changed, you know, talked about blood memory, talked about, um, of course, ethnocide and um, epigenetics. And what they said, <laughs> oh, is that all that is? Okay. <laughs> all right. And what they said was that what the Jewish people went through in that Holocaust is analogous to what a lot of people go through, including indigenous people, in this Holocaust that has happened in, well, not Holocaust, I, want to, I go on and call it genocide, in the US and in um, Canada. Um, <coughs> I remember at the university at Buffalo, when I was in graduate school, there was, <laughs> Hard to do. There was a, um, a speaker that came in, Maria Yellow, Braveheart, Yellow Horse, I can't remember her, but she and uh, her colleagues have the, been the one who coined that phrase, intergenerational trauma. And she too did a lot of research and, and you know, compared the Holocaust survivors to those of this indigenous genocide in the U.S. And um, I think I might have wrote, noted some of her, her quotes there. I want to say that most of that art that's on there is my son's art. And that was actually the first piece that he ever did, that turtle. And now he won't sell those pieces anymore because he feels they're appropriation. He feels like they're more like West Coast 
and so he won't sell them. And I thought that was really something because I said, it's not like you traced it, it's still your work, but he's like, no, I'm not selling it anymore. So I said, okay, you know, you do, you do that. Um, recently, past few weeks, I've been doing a um, narrative medicine course is what I call it. And it's just on the res and it's part of our, our leisure guide. So on Wednesdays from 10 to 12, I have like 12 mostly retired elderly women, one, one dude in there. <laughs> and, you know, we talk about storytelling. We talk, talk about how writing is very therapeutic, very healing. And I just, I just wanted to mention that because I, I see it's in there too. Um, a lot of talk recently about land-based healing. And I think about this time when I was in um, graduate school and I had to do an interview with an elder. And I chose an elder that I knew and I went and called him and I went to his house to do the interview. And I asked him, where do you want to be interviewed? He said, I want to be interviewed in my garden. He said, because that is where I go when I need to think, when I need to heal. That is where I like to be, putting my hands in that warm earth because there's such a transference of energy. It calms me. It gives me peace. Um, in March, I went with a group and we went to um, maple tapping, maple tree tapping. And I, it was with this um, elder. I don't know if he's an elder because he seemed like he's younger than me. Rod Miller, and he did a lot of teachings about the maple tree and, and the, the maple sap. And that, I said to him on the way back out of the, the bush, because we went in about three fields, four fields deep, I said, what, how would you define land-based healing? And he said, it's being on the land. It's just being outside and just being mindful of, of what you're doing. Cause we can be outside, but not be, be mindful. We're just trying to get from A to B and we're in a hurry and we're not even looking around us and we're not seeing the leaves falling, nothing. We're not paying attention to what it feels like to walk through those leaves or to walk through that snow. We're just on our way. It's just a point A to point B. And then there was a um, fish trapping that I went to as well and we learned how to make fish traps and we went down to the river and we threw them in. And that too was just so powerful, I guess is the word. And after those, you know, those times when I was out in the bush, just being out in the bush is, is healing in itself. So I would say, yeah, absolutely. Um, Land acknowledgement. I think that was the one that I had on there when I was at the University at Buffalo. So that's a little different than here because, um, you know, there's other, other. I don't think we even mentioned the Mississaugas of the credit and other people that were originally in this area on that one. I should have changed it. Um, Thomas Indian School, they call that the asylum. That's what they said. If you ask any of the elders who had been there, they don't say Thomas Indian School. They say Sal Salem or Salem. That's what they mean. They say Salem. That's where my father was. Um, same thing. They call it a boarding school, but it was a residential school. A lot of abuse went on there, too. And they, um, they didn't save the school. It's not there anymore. Um, I was going to read one more, if I have time. And then I'll do question and answers. All right. Um, this one is called institutionalized racism. And this, well, I'll just read it. I won't introduce it. I called my sister because I couldn't sleep. I was lying in my bed hard, trying hard to go to sleep, but sleep eluded me. In flashes and bits, my mind kept reliving a traumatic day. It was Saturday, March 20th, 1999. I'd gotten up early and I left the house to go out and get some groceries before the kids woke up. I took my time and was relishing some me time, even if it was only wandering through Walmart to stock up on household necessities, then stopping to drop off, drop off a coat that needed cleaning, and finally stopping at movie time to pick up a couple of DVDs to watch that night. That was before Netflix. <laughs> one movie for the kids and one movie for us. By the time I arrived home that day, it was the afternoon. 
My husband said, you need to call Peg, my sister, Denise, right away. I had a cell phone from work, but I left it home as I slipped out for the weekend errands. I wish now I had taken it. I called Peg and she answered right away and said that she was at the emergency room with our older brother, David, and that I needed to get there immediately. My heart began to beat faster because of the fear I heard in the undertone of her voice. I didn't stay to put the groceries away or even get a chance to watch the movies that night. They had all been intended for entertainment and relaxation that weekend. All was forgotten as anxiety, fear, pain, and grief took over my life that day. Overshadowing all other thoughts of parenting, cooking, cleaning, work, or any other everyday tasks that usually filled my weekend and my life. Driving to the hospital in my Dodge Caravan, my mind was focused on David Craig Hill, only 43 years old. He had recently moved back home after living in Tacoma, Washington for about 16 years. He had been stationed there while serving in the U.S. Air Force, where he met his wife, Sonia. He then joined the Tacoma Police Force after his tour of duty was over. He was a sharpshooter while in the Air Force and had traveled extensively to complete in tournaments around the globe. My mom had saved clippings from the newspaper that he had sent her that documented the many trophies he had won with his eagle eye. He was talented artistically too. He could do anything, fix a car, carve a totem pole, remodel a whole house, play lacrosse, hunt fish, draw beautiful creations, and shoot a bow. Anything that he set his mind to, he accomplished. I thought of his son, Dustin, who at 19 had died less than eight months earlier. He tried to wrestle a gun away from his friend so he wouldn't shoot someone else. And in the process, he had lost his life trying to protect others. We had all experienced so much pain and loss that we had not yet completely processed it. Now what? Nothing could possibly be wrong with Dave because he was strong, he was invincible, he took care of himself, he jogged, he exercised, and he was in good shape. I thought maybe he cut himself at work and needed stitches, or maybe fell while working and broke something and needed a cast. My mind wouldn't let me think past those possibilities, no matter what Peg said. She was a nurse, and I was sure that she was overreacting, worst case scenario thinking. She must have misunderstood what the health professionals were saying, and there was nothing to worry about. Or, more plausible, I misunderstood what she was saying to me. It was easier for my mind to deny that it could be anything serious or life-threatening. Once I got to the hospital, my emotional defense mechanisms failed me miserably because there was no denying that he was gravely ill. I have no medical background. I couldn't comprehend the gravity of the situation like Peg did. Walking into the ER and seeing him lying on the gurney tore at my heart. It made my stomach ache and I felt dizzy instantly. His forehead was deeply furrowed with lines that indicated to me that he was in a great deal of pain. His eyes were always bright and glinted when he smiled and laughed, but now they were dulled with dark circles around them. It was hard to understand what he was saying to me. There was no liveliness. No light-hearted bantering back and forth that was usually part of our greeting to one another. He was suffering severely. It was obvious to me just looking at him. I wanted someone to come in there post-haste and fix him, relieve his suffering. It was about 1.30 p.m. and Peg was the only family member there with him. David had been brought into the Niagara Falls Memorial Medical Center by a rural metro ambulance. He had been vomiting en route and still had the bucket the EMTs had given him during the ride to the hospital. Peg was providing the only care he seemed to be receiving while in the emergency room. Peg went to the nurse's station numerous times to first inform them and then reiterate that David had chronic hypertension and that they needed to do something to reduce his blood pressure. Nothing was done by the medical staff except to give him compazine to reduce his vomiting. 
Peg stated that Dave was losing the ability to speak and swallow. She was clean, cleaning his mouth with large lemon-flavored cotton swabs. She was down to the last one, and she asked me to go to the nurse's station and ask for additional swabs, which I did. Upon reaching the desk, I stood there for a couple minutes, and neither the nurse nor the doctor sitting there made any attempt to acknowledge me standing in front of them. I finally voiced my request for additional swabs. I held up the empty package so that they would know what I needed. No one made any movements to get up and respond to my request for assistance. Instead, a middle-aged nurse finally looked up at me and said, we don't have any more of those, then turned away from me and went back to her documenting. I walked back to Peg and I told her what had transpired. I think that was her tipping point. She was scared exasperated, frustrated at the lack of standard level of medical care being provided for our brother. She stood up and I got out of her way. She had reached the end of her rope and I saw the rage in her eyes. She didn't have to say anything to me, but I knew that she was raging at the lack of concern, which was beyond disrespect. It was equivalent to disregard or depersonalization, negligence for David's well-being. I wasn't aware of it then, but David had begged her, don't let me die right before I arrived. It seemed there was nothing she could do to get anyone's attention, to realize the severity of his medical condition. By this time, it was almost 6 p.m., and David had been in the ER for seven hours. Peg stormed the nurse's station. She was beyond angry, and the tone and volume of her voice made sure the doctor and the nurses knew it. She related to them again all the symptoms that she was observing in our brother. Displayed on almost every door was a poster about strokes. It wasn't the fast posters they now have. It listed symptoms of headache, visual disturbances, floaters, blind spots, loss of speech and vomiting. And he had all those warning signs and she told them she believed he was having a stroke. The doctor on call said to her, do you know what a stroke is? To which she replied, yes, I do. The doctor then stated, well, I've been studying for over eight years and I don't even know what a stroke is. The word furious couldn't even begin to describe what Peg was feeling in that moment. It was more like helplessness, hopelessness, because no one was listening to her or acknowledging her fears. She came back without any lemon swabs. A nurse followed her into the cubicle to examine David. She saw for herself that he couldn't swallow his speech was incomprehensible, incomprehensible. I think he had already slipped into the coma. The rest of the medical staff rushed into the area and began shouting areas and told us, began shouting orders and told us to leave and go to the waiting room. David's fiance, Tara, and most of our siblings had arrived. And as we were walking back to the waiting room, a voice on the intercom said, Dr. Quick, to the ER, Dr. Quick, ER. Peg dropped to the floor next to me, sobbing. She repeated, he's dead, he's dead. I had no idea that this code meant all staff were needed as the patient was in imminent danger of dying. Instead, I was embarrassed and I tried to get Peg up by pulling on her arms and saying, he's all right, he's gonna be all right, get up. Peg just said again, he's dead, as she let me help her back up. Tears welled up in my eyes at the sight of the pain on her face. That same nurse came into the waiting room and took us to another waiting room that was somewhere deeper inside the hospital. It seemed we walked through a maze to get to it. She told us the doctor was coming to talk to us. We waited for about 20 minutes and the same doctor who had been so condescending and dismissive to, beg, to Peg came back to talk to us. He said things like, oh, he's so clean for an alcoholic. He has such good musculature for an alcoholic, and he has such good dental work for an alcoholic. I stopped him and I said, wait, who told you that my brother was an alcoholic? He is not. And he said, oh, um, uh, one of the nurses, one of the nurses, I think. And I replied, no, we told those nurses that he was a police officer, a sharpshooter. He is not an alcoholic. And I said that he does smoke, and the doctor in a very contemptuous voice said, smokes what? 
like he expected me to say marijuana, you know, back when it wasn't legal. Instead, I said Marlboro Reds. At this point, the doctor continued on with all his medical jargon mumbo jumbo for quite a while. I had shut down emotionally. I could hear his voice, but I couldn't comprehend anything he was saying. It didn't matter then, did it? It was too late, wasn't it? My brother, my hero, my mom's favorite son, we always said that, because he was, <laughs> was for all intents and purposes already dead. He had slipped into a coma from which he never awoke. He was dead because, in their racist minds, he was nothing but some drunken Indian who had wandered into the ER probably after a night of heavy drinking and was throwing up an inconvenience. What the hell were they supposed to do about it? They disregarded everything Peg said to them because of their institutionalized racism. He was just another drunken Indian, not worthy of any heroic measures to save his life. David was on life support for five days. He had no brain activity. That same nurse came to us and asked us for his organs. Fuck no, fuck you. We were told that he had suffered a cerebral vascular accident, a stroke. I don't think it was an accident. I think it could have been prevented if they had gotten off their asses and provided an acceptable standard level of medical care to my beloved brother. Weeks later, I picked up the coroner's report with my sister, and he said that he had never seen anything like it before. David's brain was like foam, maybe due to the hypertension. All I knew was that my brother suffered and they did nothing to ease his suffering. They could have been, they should have been held accountable. They weren't. Our family met with a lawyer. We felt something had to be done to address the substandard care that David was provided in that emergency room. One of the first things the lawyer did was to dispatch a letter requesting all the medical records from that day and all subsequent care during his hospitalization. We waited months before we received a response. And when the lawyer got the records, the doctor's notes had been doctored. They were bogus. They said he walked in on his own when he was transported via ambulance. They listed many procedures that didn't ever happen. The lawyer said that they couldn't move forward because based on the information they were sent. I wrote a letter to the CEO of the hospital outlining what had happened that day. He called me and he, we talked. The main thing I wanted him to be aware of was the systemic racism and inhumane treatment my brother suffered at the hands of his staff. We discussed cultural sensitivity, cultural competence, cultural dissonance, institutionalized racism. He agreed to allow me to come to the hospital and do a cultural sensitivity training session. I stated I wanted that nurse and the doctor to be in attendance. She was, he wasn't. She sat in the front row, arms crossed. She wouldn't look me in the eye. I could tell she wasn't actively listening to me. She seemed too hardened to even attempt to engage in a discussion. My only hope is that medical staff wouldn't continue to view all indigenous people through that racist lens as alcoholic, lazy, dirty, living high on the hog off that casino money. I don't think they internalized any of the information I was trying to con transmit to them. Because I've heard multiple stories since then of other indigenous people presenting at their ER and again being treated with disrespect, spoken too disparagingly. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And I gotta say this, that not too long ago, right before COVID hit, I fell at work and I um, hurt my shoulder. I caught myself on the desk and I heard something snap in there. And I went to Brentford General Hospital and um, I, I got to see the doctor, it was a woman. And the first thing she said to me is, I need a list of your meds. And I said to her, I don't take any meds. No, I need a list of all your medication that you're taking. And I said, I don't take any medication. No, no, I need everything. I need like your blood pressure medicine and I need your, your diabetes medicine. And I said, I don't take anything but vitamins. 
And again, she asked me, and again, she asked me. She wouldn't believe me that I'll take medicine. So I don't know whether she, you know, was thinking, well, you're a very morbidly obese woman, so you've got to have diabetes, you've got to have high blood pressure. Or was she thinking, oh, you're just pretending that you hurt your shoulder because you're drug-seeking and you're looking for opiates or something. Like, what was it? I don't know. But anyway, she said, well, you can go back to work tomorrow. And I'm like, no, I can't go back to work tomorrow because I can't lift my arm up, because I can't lift my arm up, I can't move it, because I couldn't, I couldn't move it. So she sent me out of the emergency room, signed my paper, said, you can go back to work tomorrow, and I said, I can't. So I went to the doctor on the res the next morning. He sent me to go get an ultrasound, and I had a complete tear through my supraspinatus, and when they did surgery to reattach it, the under part, which was, I think, a subspinatus, that was also almost torn through. But yeah, so I think there's still a little racism going on still in 2022. And when is it ever going to change? One other thing I want to mention is that this book here, have any of you seen this? This is the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And there's 94 calls to action. These aren't recommendations. These are, we must act, we should act. And this was done in 2016. They completed this. And today, nine of them have been done. Nine out of 94. How many is that, mathematicians? How many more we got to go? Quite a bit, I got to say. Um, Oh, that's my grandson. I made him his outfit. He won first prize. He was eight months old and he was already walking. He was running, little crazy boy. Cain Obadiah. Um, now he's six. <laughs> so that was a while ago. Um, any questions? Comments? Am I too fierce? <laughs> Because her language, she didn't lose it. It was taken from her. It was beaten out of her. And I, um, you know, I, re I remember various phrases that I, I learned from my grandmother, mostly food. I shared already. Um, the one thing, um, um, I said it to you very easily today, fry bread, de galistoya. The galistoya means fry bread. And I always thought it meant, oh, it just means fry bread. But what it really means is these this things, these things bumping together in the grease. That's what fry bread is. It's You put it in the grease and it <coughs> fries like that. Because mohawk is very descriptive. And so I wanted to be able to understand and, and, and know words that, you know, were originally our first language that we lo that was taken. Um, my grandmother used to say, soju guskus what gadadoni. And I never knew what that meant. I just kind of knew it meant I ate too much. But when I looked into it, soji in Mohawk means um, a lot, too much. Guskus means pig. And what gadadoni, when it starts with wa, it means me. Say, it means you, if it starts with a say. So what got a doni is meaning that I ate too much and I made myself big like a pig again. Yeah. So that kind of stuff is just, digatswani. Digatswani is another word my grandmother taught me. And I find out that digatswani is pie. That's, but, and I don't know all the fruits or nia hundesa. Nia hundesa is strawberry. So I want nia hundesa. They got swanee. I want a strawberry pie, right? So that's why I want to learn these words. I want to understand what they mean. So maybe I can pass them down to my kids, grandkids. And my, my grandson, my oldest son's son, he is 10. And he is watching these cartoons on YouTube in Mohawk, because he lives in New York State. And he's, he's coming up with some words that even I don't know. So. I think it's pretty wonderful and amazing. Thank you. I want to share that I made my necklace. 
And um, so for me, what this represents are these are the many, many children and the many, many different nations that they came from. That's why all the oranges are different. And this, of course, is the sun, and this is their spirits. Their spirits want to come out from where they are, and they want to go home. And that's what I made to represent survivors. Well, they weren't survivors. We're still looking for their graves. Right now at the Woodland Cultural Center, they, um, the survivors group has done fundraising and they bought their own ground penetrating radar. They have two of them. There are 600 acres that they are currently um, wanting to look at, whatever you call that. And I think they've looked at maybe 1.2% of those 600 acres so far. And then once the frost hits, they have to stop for the winter and start again in the spring. And um, yeah, my worry is when, because it's not if, when they find these graves, that's going to hit our community pretty hard. And I worry that there are not enough mental health providers. There are not enough now. Never mind when that hits us. It's going to be scary and, yeah, hard. Yes. So it's the same style or you're putting it in a different style? Um, well, those schools are closed. Those residential schools are closed. And they are trying to bring the language back. They have language nests where for, at daycare. Kids go to daycare and they learn the language. They have total immersion programs. They have a lot of programs on the reserve to learn the language. I was enrolled in a full-time language program, but my first day there was um, my first day on the job here right before COVID hit. So I, my caseload exploded and then my language had to go to Zoom and I couldn't do that. <laughs> you know, my internet is not very good and I just, I needed to be there to hear it in person instead of being kicked off my internet all the time. So I resigned from that program, but you know, I'm thinking maybe right now, Monday nights, I'm just taking a one night course that's an hour long, which of course you're never gonna get fluent in, but at least I'm still learning little by little. But my niece is still in the program. She's in her third year and she's, she's amazing. She can speak in Mohawk. Yeah. What you do, because you have it still for the class. Mm -hmm. So I want to explain um, I've been doing some research about, well, I'm talking about social work, which is what, you know, usually it's facts or CAS, um, who would be the ones going in there now to take children away, right? So what is really happening is sometimes People are working with indigenous communities who don't have an understanding of indigenous communities and who have, you know, this viewpoint of this is where everybody should be across the board. And when you don't meet this level, whether it's socioeconomic, you know, you don't have running water, you don't have a central heating or air conditioning system, then this, you know, is maybe third world conditions. We can't have children living like that. But I think that you need to be you know, in social work, start where that child family is, right? And so myself, I grew up in a home where, on the reserve where we didn't have running water, you know, we had a slop pail. We didn't have central heat, we had a wood stove. And I think that if somebody went in there today in that kind of a home, they might say, oh no, kids can't live like this, we gotta take them out. And I think sometimes that may still be happening, you know, and then, it shouldn't be. It should not be happening because as long as those children are being fed, clothed, you know, kept warm, why? Why would you take them from their parents unless, you know, there's proof that they're being abused or they're being starved or they're, you know, not getting the proper medical care or whatever. And maybe educational neglect too. They look at that as a no, no, but sometimes you can homeschool your kids. So I think you have to be really aware of what that community, 
home life is and not go in there and try to impose your own beliefs that are kind of, you know, from the main population, not those that are marginalized, which a lot of communities are, especially way up north and even anywhere. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. Yes. I think what a memory keeper is, well, first of all, for me, writing is healing. Writing these stories for me has cut that emotional tether to some of them that are traumatic memories, right? And so people sometimes do EMDR, rapid eye movement, reprocessing and desensitization. And, you know, I do that with clients and I've done it myself. And I find writing is almost like that for me. And so I just, as a memory keeper, it is more about trying to understand what our role is as indigenous people in this contemporary world. Where is it that we, how is it that we can be remembered or looked at as we are not extinct, because <laughs> some people think that, thinks that we are. I remember coming across the border during the pandemic, and I was on the Canadian side, coming back here, coming back home, and I noted that the, the immigration official or customs or whatever he was had on a little orange pin. And I said to him, I really like that you had that pin on. And he said, well, you know, I went to university in Canada and I graduated with a history degree and never in all of my studies everywhere did I ever hear about residential school, not once. I had no idea until recently about it. And then, you know, we got to talk and then we both got to be crying on the bridge together. <laughs> I was the only one on the bridge because I could still cross because my family is still all over there, my children, my grandchildren, and I could cross. Yeah, so I don't know if I answered that question or not because I kind of ramble. But I think that that's what it is, is that it's just keeping those memories alive, writing so that people can have an understanding of what that impact of residential school was on human children, people, you know, and look at us as equal. We're the same. And, and I think about how, how would, you know, when, when people say to me, well, you know, that was a long time ago, get over it. You know, that of course makes my hackles come up and I get a little militant and I get a little, yeah. And I say, well, how about, you know, you got children at home? How about I come and take one of your kids? You know, and I tell them that English is wrong and they gotta come to Mohawk Immersion School and they gotta learn how to speak Mohawk because that's the right way. And they gotta go to Longhouse because that's the right way because I say so. How does that feel to you? How are you going to get over that? It's very hard for me to get over that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I get a little too fierce, sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, any questions about that up there? That is a picture taken of all the survivors in front of the, the um, Mohawk Institute. That too was, um, that, should be, that should be September 30th, not October. I had to go fix that. That was the third orange shirt day they had there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Hillary Weaver right there. She is, a, um, that first quote, she is, was one of my professors at the University at Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Carlisle. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.